everybody, Nigel and Jess here with you and uh, this is just a bit of a preface to the video. Um, this is a beginner's video so bear in mind it's going back to basics so please bear that in mind with your comments. Um, this is of the B52 from Monogram Revell and all its different guises. So um, <clears throat> yeah if you want to see the build uh, jump forward about 23-25 minutes and you'll see the build. Uh, it, as I said it's back to basics in this video we're going to cover seam removal, part removal from the sprues, we're going to look at um, filling of uh, ejector pin marks, identifying ejector pin marks and basically some assembly of the undercarriage. So we're not doing a hell of a lot of building but there's a lot of information here for, for you if you're new to the hobby. So um, if you're not new to the hobby you just want to see how this model goes together as I say skip forward 23-25 minutes and you'll see some building. So um, it's bye from us. Say bye. Bye. Hi everybody, Nigel here with you, Nigel's Modeling Bench. Before we go any further, don't forget to hit that subscribe, hit the bell to get your notifications, and if you like this video, please hit the like. And if you dislike it, hit dislike. Um, right, so this is it. This is the start of our beginner's build project on the B-52 bomber. And we're going to be using this kit here. Now it's a massive box, so I'm never going to get it all in the camera. But basically this is the Monogram B-52 in this boxing. I've done a video already about the different boxings. Have a look at that one a couple of weeks back. Uh, and you'll see on there there's all the different boxings. And they're all basically the same kit. So if whatever you've got, if you've got Ravel, Monogram, the Hasegawa version, they're all the same. So um, the only thing that differs is the colour schemes. Obviously there's one with an X15 and then you've got the, the original one with the same module and everything in it. Um, say same module, it's a plastic barrel with a motor. Um, and then you've got the um, the Revell boxy, which is much thinner with different decals and everything. And there's also the Hasegawa one. So basically that's what we're going to be building. Most, with most beginners videos you would start with recommended tools, I've already done that, I've done a video, if you look back, if you click down on my name just below the screen down here, um, you will see down there, you click on there, you will see a list come up with, with all the different bits and pieces, second one across is videos, click on videos and then you'll get a list going across the screen and you'll see on there some quite recent B52 videos, have a look on there and you'll see the one about the boxings and you will see the one about the... Um, the beginner's guide, the intro, which is tools and everything. The one thing I don't think I did cover was cutting mats. Make sure you get yourself a good cutting mat, especially if you're working and you know on your kitchen table or, or your you know, one of your favourite pieces of furniture. You don't want to be damaging it or anything. So um, so basically, yeah, tools refer to part one or or the intro. Anything I missed or come up with during the uh, during the video builds. By all means, drop me a comment down below and ask the question, and I will answer it. Remember, there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you want to email me, it's nigelsmodelingbench at gmail.com. Please keep your questions short and to the point. And also, if you ask a question about something I've covered in the video, i.e., if I say I feel the best paints to use on this model are Vieco, and you get this set here. If I, get a, if I get an email that says, what do you recommend are the best paints and is there a set available? I'm not going to answer it because I get a lot of questions, I get a lot of answers, I have to do a lot of answers and I'm not going to waste my time on a computer screen writing emails to people that can't be bothered to take the time to watch the video. So I'm sorry about that, but if you ask me a question, I've covered it, then I probably won't answer. If your answer does become short and sweet, it's only because I've got loads to cover. Um... So, all about paints. See, these are the paints I'm going to use. They are Viejo Model Air Colours and they come in, a, you've got the set of eight paints in there, 17 mil. Be careful when you buy these paints, sometimes they have very small pots in them. Um, so basically, yeah, there's our B-52 on the bottom there. So we've got the SAC colours we need and this is the Vietnam War uh, 71204. I think this would be very, obviously very good for airbrushing. I think it's also quite good for brush painting. If you are brush painting your whole model, perhaps go down the Humbrol route. Humbrol brushes very well. Tamiya tends not to brush very well unless you get the retarder for it. Mr. Hobby brush is okay and can be thinned with water. Um, so yeah, you pay your money, you take your choice. There's a million people out there that tell you that this paint is the best and it is basically down to opinion. Um, some people, especially the, uh, the older generation of us, shall we say, would never touch acrylic paint. They would only ever use enamels. I personally only use enamel for detail work. 
purely because a they're not a very nice smell i don't like the smell of them and b they take ages to dry so pays your money takes your choice airbrushing um if you are a beginner i would suggest if you're going to get into this hobby go and get yourself a little airbrush or compressor setup i've just looked on amazon believe it or not there is a setup on there a compressor and an airbrush with the hose and everything 29.99 i couldn't believe it so it's obviously not going to be very good but it's probably going to be okay to get you going so um perhaps have a look and if you can afford it there's ones on there for 50 or 60 pound perhaps move up to that which is still cheap as ships i mean my iwata airbrush here which is a revolution br i think i paid about 100 pound for that on its own just the airbrush no hose or anything so you know 29.99 for a full setup it isn't going to be that sort of quality having said that this is a cheap airbrush i bought with a compressor about 70 or 80 pound i think i used this for i don't know seven ten years and didn't have anything else and i still use it now it's it's fine absolutely fine so go and get yourself a cheap airbrush rather than brush painting it's going to be much much better so then on to the model so you've got your kit you've had it delivered if you've just bought this kit, you'd have bought it second hand because there are no new ones out there. Um, go through it with a fine tooth comb. Check the kit. Make sure everything's there. Make sure nothing's broken. Um, make sure nothing's been started. Also, read your eBay explanations very carefully. There's one on there now. Well, there's two on there now, which have got the, the black boxing with Big Bad Beautiful on the front. Um, one of them is advertised as brand new. If you read the small print, it tells you it's been started. And it's £65 by it now. Another one is on there as used. It's a brand new kit, unstarted. And it's an auction It's starting at £45. There's a couple of days left as I speak today. So be very, very careful when you read the listings. It says brand new and then the kit's actually started. So what's the point in that? Um, if you check your kit and you find you've got parts missing, contact the seller. They're obviously they're normally going to be really, really good. If you've got a major part, like a fuselage half or something missing, then probably best get a refund. But if there's some smaller parts missing or something that you can replace with aftermarket, like if the wheels are missing, you can say to them, look, I've just bought this kit off you. I've paid £50 for it. A couple of the wheels are missing. I can get some resin wheels for £22.99. If you want to give me the £22.99, I'll go and buy them. And I've had exactly that with this kit. Clear parts were missing. I contacted the seller. I said I can get a VAC form screen for $7.99 from Hanant. If you'd like to refund me the $7.99, I will go and buy that. And that's what I've done. So I can now use the VAC form screen on another one of my models. And I've pinched the clear parts out of another kit for this one. So there we go. Everybody's happy. Um, so yeah, worth doing. Check, check your parts all the way through. Make sure they're good. Now, normally, first thing I'll be doing recommending for a beginner is to wash the parts. Wash them in warm, soapy water rinse them in cold water and leave them to air dry. I'm not going to do that with this kit, basically for two reasons. One is it's quite simple and there's a lot of very big chunky parts. We're going to do a lot of handling and everything on it. Two, a lot of this model is going to need seam work, filling, you know, repairing, cleaning up and everything. So we're going to be handling it a lot. So there's no real point in washing the wings, say, when you're going to be holding the wings to assemble them we're not going to be wearing gloves all the way through so the reason you're washing it is to remove any grease or mold release agent left from the mold or any grease from people touching it and stuff so i would normally recommend that for example if you were building a very very complex engine or a tank turret or something you need to make sure those parts are grease free because when you start spraying it you don't want all fish eyes appearing everywhere you know when you when you put paints onto grease it kind of runs away so you don't want to be getting into that next thing is familiarize yourself with the instructions now with this one i've got two sets of instructions because i've got an old revel kit as well as the the monogram kit so this is the monogram kit instructions and these are the revel kit instructions so we'll stick to the monogram because that's what we're doing and you can see here it all folds out okay <clears throat> start by reading all that it says read this before you begin and the first thing it says is study the assembly drawings go through the kit make sure you understand everything make sure you understand you know you're going to be painting and stuff like here we've got letters down here to denote the paints so when you come to build your model it will say here k okay k in a black square k is zinc chromate all right now i will go through these colors for you and i will give you recommendations on what you should use as and when we need them uh, because a lot of manufacturers these days will say 
you know this one is Tamiya XF4 I believe yeah XF4 zinc chromate um, but all they say on here is zinc chromate so there's no manufacturers paint colors being called out so make sure you go through the instructions understand the legends here so this is saying optional parts you're going to make two do not cement uh, remove and throw away so it's going to look like a piece of sprue you're going to cut out um, glue together cement together and uh, this is telling you deco application so that's your different symbols as you go through to tell you and you look, if you look here like with your bomb doors it's telling you here don't glue the hinges because you want your glue bomb doors to work but it's telling you here to glue where there's a star so you've got a star here so it's telling you to glue on there and then we're going to put that hinge plate on there okay so that's a that's worth remembering with these legends and stuff so then have a look in the instructions go through and these are very unusual compared to modern day instructions even if we look at the old Ravel kit you know if we look in here you've got no words it's all just pictures drawings and arrows there's no actual wording or anything about how to do anything whereas in this kit it's really really strange I think it's been a backward step in the model industry to be honest they have words in here that's telling you how to deal with assembling such a large assembly and not having the glue dry out. You know, you don't get this sort of thing in modern kits. So it's it's worth reading all this and taking it in because it's good information to carry forward to your, uh, to, you know, to your next model. So, like I say, we're going to start at step one in the instructions. And it's telling you here four of these. So you're going to make four of them. So... And it's telling you here you're going to remove where there's a star. You can see this telling there's a star. There's a bit of sprue sticking out there. So you're going to remove that and clean up. And we're going to go through all that. How to clean up the seams and everything. And how to make it all look lovely and smooth. Not like a piece of moulded plastic. And then it's telling you we're going to add this into the undercarriage here. Into the undercarriage bay. Now we may choose not to fit the wheels and tyres. We may feel so, choose to leave the wheels off. And just have the legs sticking out. Unfortunately... Most kits, the last thing you would do is fit the undercarriage because they're going to get broken off. This kit, the way it goes together, you can't do that. You have to put it in now. So unfortunately, with this kit, we're going to have to be very careful and not break anything off. But I think what we will do is leave the wheels off and then we'll just have the legs sticking out, which is a lot less area to be knocked off. It's less likely to catch on things. Then we're going to move on to the doors. Now, I'm going to glue my Bombay's doors closed and I'm going to show you how I'm going to make sure that I make it all look good instead of having massive gaps. When we get there, I'll show you there's massive gaps because it's designed for the Bombay doors to open. You must remember this kit was developed in 1968. So it originally came out as a monogram uh, kit with a, a motor and everything in it to make a noise. So it was designed for children. Models back in those days weren't designed for adults. They were designed for children. Your, your modern day stuff like your Tacums and your Meng and everything, they're not, on the whole, they're not designed for kids. They're designed for adults. So they tend to be a lot more sort of technical. They tend to be a lot more complicated, much, much better fit. Uh, they're sort of looking for accuracy rather than ease of manufacture, particularly a manufacturer like Bronco. If you're a beginner, stay away from Bronco. Um, then we're going to move on to the cockpit. Again, we've got very, very simple here. The seats are actually part of the cockpit, uh, the pilot's bottom. So we're going to be putting the pilots in and I'll show you how we're going to paint them and everything. And then we're going to add the cockpit into the fuselage, add this little side window here. And then we're going to put the instrument panel in. You can see you've got the symbol there with the decal. So that's saying we've got the decal going in there. And blah -de blah -de blah So basically you go through and you familiarise yourself with everything and make sure you understand all this telling you in here and you understand how we're going to go. Okay, so there's your familiarising. Now the next thing I would always recommend, now if you're a total beginner, you may want to ignore this, but it's worth remembering. Now, something I always do with my models is I get them and I look at the instructions and I go through and I'm looking for major sub-assemblies. Now, the first one you see is the tyres. So I think what we should do is get all the wheel halves off and glue them together. And then we can just put them to one side. We've got these massive wing tanks. These massive fuel tanks for the wings. Glue them together, put them to one side. We've got our pylons here. Glue them together, put them to one side. Engine tops and bottoms, perhaps. I don't know. Perhaps we'll do that. Perhaps we won't. 
And again, we've got engines here. We've got bomb halves. We'll glue them together. We'll put them to one side. Sorry, I had to pause it. There was a really loud motorbike outside just revving the engine. So basically, um, the reason I do that is so that round here, you've got a very large seam. When it comes to the point where we want to fit these tanks, we want that seam to be dry and hard so we can sand it, we can deal with the seam, we can put some filler in it, we can put some sprue glue in it, we can do whatever and I'll show you all that as we go. But basically it's a good idea to get all your major sub-assemblies done up front. Now, if you watch my other videos, you will see, particularly with my Bronco build, I don't follow the instructions. I tend to work to my own routine. But with this model, I will follow the instructions. But I'm still going to do this with these major assemblies. The wheels, the tyres, these fuel tanks, these pylons. And I think that may be it. When, when it I think maybe we'll do the tail planes and the, and the fin um, out of sequence as well. So that it's all ready to go on. And I'll explain all that when I come to it. So, there we go. So the next thing we need to look at is glue. Um, I talked about this a bit in tools. Your glues is a minefield. There's loads of people that will tell you this is the best, this is the best, this is the best. For general assembly, I would recommend this one, Tamiya Extra Thin with the darker green top. This is the extra thin quick setting. Um, you don't need this one to start with. Um, if you want to buy it, go and buy it, but you don't need it. If you're on a budget, just get that one. If you can't get Tammy Extra Thin in your area, perhaps try and get this one, Mr. Cement SP. Uh, this is a Guns product, um, or this one here, Mr. Cement S. I like these because this one here, the SP, is quick setting, and it's got a much bigger brush than the Tamiya. You can see there. So when it does come to doing large assemblies or you really want to pile the glue into a joint and get it in there and when I say pile it in don't worry I'll show you all this this is a far better route to take for more fine detail work this one if you're only ever going to buy one glue for modeling get that one okay if it's only one glue buy you buy buy that one okay and we call it glue it's not glue it's a solvent cement it doesn't glue stuff together okay if I put some of this on two pieces of cardboard, it will not glue it together. If I put some of this on two pieces of cardboard, it will glue them together. If I put them on two pieces of plastic, it will glue them together. Glass, metal, anything, it will glue it together. That is a glue, okay? It's taking two, two substrate materials and gluing them together. What this stuff does, what these cements do, all of them here, they weld. In, in, in fact, this one there, the Revell Contact as well, what they're doing is they are welding the plastic together. So they're in effect melting the plastic. So you put the two parts together, you get a join where the plastic melts and it becomes one. It all molds into each other, becomes one, and you end up with this molded seam, which is much, much stronger than any other form you're going to get. As we all know, welding steel together is much stronger than riveting steel together. And basically, think of that as riveting, think of that as welding. So there we go. So um, yeah, if you only ever get one glue, get this one, Tammy Extra Thin. I would also suggest you get this one as well. Now this one's got the label missing. I've got another one here with the label on. And you can see what this is. This is Revell Contact Professional Mini. You can get all sorts of different sizes. Um, I think you also get these in their little starter sets. So you might want to get one of those little starter kits and, uh, and get yourself a, a little bottle of glue. Really, really good for large assemblies. Like for instance, um, these tanks. Um, you might want to go around there with the contact first, get them together, hold them together, make sure it's all right. And then you can run around with some extra thin afterwards and I'll explain all that when we come to do it. So what are we going to do? We're we going to make a start? I think we should. Okay, so if you can hear something like buzzing in the background, it's the rain. It is absolutely pouring down. So, um, I'll start off looking at both of these instructions. Bearing in mind this is for beginners, so people who aren't beginners, please bear with me. Uh, we were all beginners once. Um, it says on here, for the airplane is to be assembled with retracting landing gear amid steps 1, 2 and 6. So it's telling us to don't bother with that, don't bother with that, and don't bother with this. Okay, so basically that's what they're telling you to do. Um, what I don't understand is why they're not telling you to... Oh, okay. Right, so this is where you need to be doing your reading. You see, now I've been building models for 
50 years and more um, and I didn't see that repeat strut mounting for front opening so you're basically going to do this in the rear and then you do that do it again in the front so you've got four of those so you're going to use two of those legs here and then we're going to use the other two of the legs here okay repeat strut mounting for front opening okay so it's telling us to omit steps one two and six if you're going to build it if you're going to have it hanging on the ceiling so um that's worth remembering so you can ignore the first bit of the bill because i will have mine on its undercarriage then if we look at the revel instructions it's basically the same um, it's telling us to do this uh, it's telling us to add these parts here and then add all that into the fuselage so it's a little bit different so slight variation so we'll look at both ways yeah, so i've just checked what Ravel are doing is having you build up one side of the undercarriage into the bay and then the other side is on this separate little piece here which goes in so you're not going to actually fit them into the fuselage yet you can go straight into doing the gun and the cockpit fit in the cockpit fit in the instrument panel glazing bomb doors so it's a slightly different build process the other thing i've noticed in the Ravel instructions if you have got the Ravel kit something i forgot to mention uh, again with paints you've got the Ravel aqua colors now Ravel are renowned for doing this and to be honest it's a royal pain in the ass um, what they do is rather than tell you what the actual color is like with monogram they've told you the zinc chromate okay but rather than take the color is they tell you to do a mix so they're telling you to use leaf green silky mat and Lufthansa yellow silky mat and mix those together now I'll bet that's zinc chromate there we go G so why they can't just tell you zinc chromate I don't know Ravel obviously don't make zinc chromate or didn't make zone chromate when, when this model was made in 1999. So they're telling you to mix paints. So you go and buy all these paints and you've got to mix them up and it's 40, 60 and everything. And you never know if you've got the right colour. Whereas it's better to just give you the colour and then you can go and find that colour elsewhere. So sort of ignore this. Ravel paint is very, very nice uh, to brush. It's very, very thick and gloopy in the pot, as you can see here. I mean... You can see there it's extremely thick. Um, so basically, um, it's really, really nice for brushing details and stuff. It can be thinned with water and it does brush out lovely, but it does take a little while to dry. Bonus to it, it's quite hard wearing. I've done a test with um, different paints. And if you look back on my videos many moons ago. So um, yeah, Ravel Aquacolor, that's the paints there. They come in these little square pots. They go a really long way because you've got 18 millimeters in here. And in here you've got 17 millilitres, but these are going to be thinned at least 50% with water. So, you know, you're going to get a really, really, well, about 50%. So you're going to get a really good lot of paint out of that one pot. So, um, yeah, so basically what we'll do is we'll stick to the monogram instructions for now, because that's the kit we're building. And what we're going to do is look at this, this first step, step one. And like I say, I'm going to start looking at sub-assemblies. So sub-assemblies, I want to start looking at the wheels. So we go through our sprues. Now on more modern kits we would have sprue A and B and everything, we don't have that here. So we're going to look through our sprues and find the wheels. Now I've got a bag here and we can see we've got wheels in there. So this bag is already open. So we're going to get this sprue out here. So we've got two identical sprues. So you can see here we've got one there and one there and that's all our wheels. So it's telling us here, to put this back in the box, so it's telling us here we need to make four of these. So there's two wheels per, and then there's two halves to each wheel. So we've got four of two, so that's eight, and then you've got two of eight, which is 16. So you can have 16 wheel halves. So as you can see, we've got eight here and eight here, and they're obviously different because you've got the inner side there with the brake detail and the outer side there with the stud detail. And for a model of this age the wheel detailer is lovely some manufacturers today don't get it that nice so um what we need to do is take these parts off the sprues now don't be tempted to start coming along and snapping them off uh, you want to cut them off now if you don't have any cutters yet I, I sincerely recommend you get some but what you can do is come along with a knife on your cutting mat and cut down like so and remove the parts like that okay so that's one way of doing it. The other way, if you've got a pair of these cheap steel side cutters, as we talked about in the, um, or snips, should I say, as we talked about in the um, 
in the tools review you could use these but make sure you don't go too close to the part because because they're cheap and generally not that sharp they sometimes tend to sort of as you cut they tend to pull a chunk of plastic with them so that's your option there and then here I'm going to use my Tamiya cutters and these are the old ones which you, you can see I've, I've chipped them there and they're really really nice um, and these we can go in you can see you just nip them like that and you can see it's so easy no fuss there's no damage and we can take them off like that the other thing I should have shown you I'm sorry is you've got your part numbers on here so you've got 18 19 18 19 so all these parts are the same um, now some older airfix kits for instance they would give every individual part a different number so these would be like 1 through 16 but um, yeah the inner wheel half is 19 and the outer wheel half is 18 so all the way through so basically all we're going to do is take off all of these parts and they're so obviously different that we can't make a mistake so we'll just do it that way That one hasn't quite gone through. There we go. So that's those off. So we'll start with these eight here. And you can see we've got a sprue nib on here sticking out. Okay, and we need to get that off. So what we can do is come in with our little cutters. And this is the beauty of having the nice ones. And we can come in and clip that off. Now I'm going to stop now. I'm going to bring the camera in closer. I just realised I've got the camera panned out too far. So I'm going to bring the camera in closer. So you get a better idea. Okay, so here we go. So we've got these sprue nibs on here. So we're just going to literally come along with our cutters and just literally just nip off the excess. Now, we're not going to worry about it too much because we've got a... We're going to have a seam that's going to have to be sanded. So when we sand the seam, we can sand the sprue nib off at the same time. If we start sanding the sprue nibs off now, we run more risk of getting a flat spot. Here we go, just nipping these off. And my intention with this build is to do pretty much nothing off camera. Now, with these 16 wheels, we'll build eight of them. Sorry, it's not 16 wheels, it's 16 halves. So we'll build four of the wheels and then I'll do four off camera because there's no point in you watching me just do everything. But my intention is I, I'm doing this as a beginner's build, so I'm not going to be sort of turning the camera off and then coming back. There we go. Undercarriage is fitted. I'm going to go through everything. And then as we move forward, I don't need to be so detailed because you'll be picking up hints and tips along the way. So as I say, experienced modelers, they might want to turn off. Um, this is for the beginners. So we can see we've got some flash on there. Flash is something that you get um, when you when the plastic leaks the two mold halves come together the plastic is injected and then the um sometimes the plastic will leak into the mold halves I'll give you an example of flash here we go you can see it here this is how it should look all nice and clean and this is how it looks so we're going to be removing flash there so that's the good thing about this kit it's old and also there were a few people that said this is hardly a beginner's kit well at the time it was made Ravel had three or monogram should I say, had three skill levels. Um, one was basically snap fit, two was some was skill required, and three, sorry, some glue may be required, and three was skill required, and this one's a number two. So I, I don't think there's any reason why a beginner can't build this other than its sheer size. Uh, there's nothing unwieldy about it. So here we can see, this is where we get, if you get into plastic modeling, there's a few different aspects. There's accuracy, which is basically the shape of things, the size of things, how well detailed they are. So that's something, a, a, a measure you can measure a company against. Then you've got your um, fit, fit and finish and everything, how well the parts actually fit together, which is on this model I think is quite good, but not the best. Uh, certainly one of the better manufacturers, or probably the best manufacturer out there for fit is going to be the Tamiya, particularly the newer Tamiya kits, or, you know, 10 years old and newer. Um, and then there's also engineering. Now, engineering is a very, very good score to look for if you are new to the hobby. Now, 
some manufacturers would just make these halves as halves and they'd be flat on the back so you could come along and accidentally glue two outer halves together what they've done here you can see we've got a, a lip on this one like a spigot diameter which goes into a recess in that side so you can't go wrong okay now the location isn't perfect but that's okay we can round all that up but basically you can't actually put you could put these together okay but you've got no location but you couldn't put these together because you'd have a massive gap in the middle so that's once one of the good things about this kit is the engineering aspect and the thoughtfulness that's gone into it another aspect to look at is um when they designed the model the actual assembly sequence if you look at my bronco build the kitty hawk bronco i'm building um the assembly sequence on that thing is an absolute joke so i would suggest beginners steer clear of that manufacturer because uh, i think you'll struggle anyway so we've got the parts off the sprues now and we've cleaned up the sprue nibs now there's something we need to do now is sand the halves and for this i'm going to use my zebra sticks and this is a 400 this is an infini zebra stick i need to get my new ones out um, but basically what I'm going to do is just on this half, I'm just going to lightly sand over the back, just make sure there's no raised areas. Okay, I'm not going mad and trying to sand loads off. All I'm trying to do is just remove any raised areas of sprue nib or flash or anything. Now obviously on these I can't do that because I've got this spigot diameter. What I can do is just go around where the sprue nibs are and just make sure there's nothing there. And that's why I'm using a 400. I'm not going to use a 200 or a 180 or something and start removing loads of plastic I just want to remove just the minimum just to make sure there's no raised parts there okay and as I say we've got that flash there I'm not going to worry about that for now all right and then we're going to start to put these together so we're going to test fit them together we can see they fit lovely now there's three sprue nibs on each wheel okay there's one on this one there's one two three and on this one we've got one two three so we may as well line them up and then instead of having six raised sprue nib areas to remove we'll only have three so if you line up those sprue nibs and we can put it together just like that okay so they're hold together like that so I can take a clamp and for this I'm going to use an ordinary clothes peg clamp it together and then I can look and make sure it's lined up what we don't want is for it to be like this we want it to be lined up so you can see I've got some movement there so I want to make sure it's all lined up now the other thing I'm just noticing here is I cannot get it lined up with it as it is so I'm going to turn and see if I can get it lined up there there we go so obviously having these sprue nibs lined up is not going to be possible. I can get a couple of them lined up, or one of them at least, or two of them. So basically if you get two halves like this that go together where you've got a raised spigot and a recess, if they're not perfectly true, when you put them together you can't physically get the parts to line up. They're out like this. So then what you do is you turn one half just sort of through 90 degrees or something and just to make sure you can get them to line up all right and then we can just put the clothes peg on there hold them together and then we can see that it's lined up and we're going to be sanding it anyway again I can't get it lined up so I'm just going to remove I'll turn it a bit more sorry and there we go that's lined up now so we've got all the way around we've got no step between the two diameters like I say we want them to line up like this not like that okay so now we've got that done I'm going to come on I'm going to use my Mr Cement SP because I've got some here in fact no, I'll use the Tammy Extra Thin because that's what I'm telling you guys is the best for you to use the only trouble with this is the brush is so small so what I'm going to do now is just lay some in there I'm going to brush it on and capillary action will pull it into the joint okay I'm not going to flood it and put too much on There we go. Now capillary action will pull the glue into the joint. Now there's another way we could do this. Okay, we can get these parts like this. Make sure they line up. 
like I say we don't want them going like this so okay I know that if I hold them like that they will go together fine now what I could do now is come in with the extra thin and put a bead around there problem with that is it will run into my fingers and then all over the tire so it's far better to do it this way if you're gonna if you want to have a joint if you want to get the glue into the joint okay you can do it like this and run the glue in again it'll go under your fingers so basically the best way to do it is like that or you could come along with your contact to cement like so and just put some around like that and then put that wheel on there give it a turn make sure the glue gets moved around I'm just going to run it around my fingers if you get glue on your fingers if you do this it'll dry out and it'll be gone don't go back and start touching things because you'll start to mark the plastic so there we go that's another way of doing it and if you want to just to make sure you get no gaps no cracks no nothing you can go around like that the other way you could do it is put that down on the bench okay get your extra thin and it will run around the joint like so put that on push them together and you can see that's instantly glued now the problem with doing it that way is I'm lucky that I put it together and I've got no step it's not like this but by far the best way to do this and we're just going to run around now just to make sure there's no gaps like I told you earlier the glue is actually not glue it's it's actually a solvent that's welding the plastic together so it will weld it together and then when you sand it there'll be no joint if you have parts where there's no glue obviously you, have, you end up with a line and it will show up when you come to do your painting so I'm going to go back to my original method and I'm going to turn this and make sure it all lines up make sure we get no steps or anything just like so and there we go just like that and there we go and then we can put a peg on there afterwards I can see now I've got a step there there we go so that's them all glued together now I said I wasn't going to do anything off camera but as I said I'm going to do the other four wheels off camera because there's no point in you watching all that so I'll glue the other four wheels together and then I'll be back right they're all done now so there's our eight wheel halves glued together and what we need to do now is let the glue set nice and hard before we start working on those seams and we'll do some sanding and everything and get rid of those those seams around the middle so good idea now is to have a little pot an old yogurt pot this is actually an old dog food container um, and basically if you just put your parts in there keep them safe and then you won't get knocked off the bench or lost or picked up by anybody you know if you've got people running around the house children cats whatever you know it's best to keep them there and then you've got all eight of them together and if you're gonna lose all eight then you're gonna lose all eight rather than just one yeah so basically now we finished with these sprues so we can put those back in the box I'm not gonna put them back in the bag because they came from this bag and we're now gonna get this bag out to use for our undercarriage now We've just seen this fall out of the bag and we can see that that is actually just a scrap piece of sprue so we'll just put that over there out of the way and what we want here are our undercarriage legs so we can see we've got here strut 20 and we've got to make four of them so here we go on the back number 20 and we need to get four of these off so what we're going to do now is just trim these parts away from the sprue like so now if you haven't got a nice little set of cutters like this you won't be able to get in there if you've got this this older type the cheaper type should I say just come in like that okay and then you can deal with it afterwards all right but if you have actually got this type these little Tamiya clippers they allow you to get in there as you can see just like so
Okay, so there we go. So they're all off now. So we've got our four undercarriage legs. Now, on here, it's telling you this star. It's saying, on here, sorry, it's saying remove. And we've got to look for that little tab on there and we can see that's actually an ejector tab. So that's how it was pressed out of the mould. So we're going to trim that off of there. And what I do, I use, this is an old um, cotton buds pot. I just have that on the side as a bin rather than that end up my bench covered in little bits of plastic. So I can come along, cut them off. Okay, so they're gone. And now we've got these sprue nibs here we need to get rid of, which are the ones I left behind because I didn't have the nice cutters. So all I've got to do to get rid of them is come in with a knife and just literally cut that away. And I'm making sure if you go, don't go like this. If you go like this, you'll damage the, the part. So you just want to come it at an angle and just make sure you don't damage the part just cut the sprue nib away okay and then we can come in then with our knife and we can clean that out like so just like that there we go now Something I think I talked about before was some um, files. If you don't have any files, I would suggest you get some. They are extremely cheap these days. Um, and basically, I mean, here is, this is a set of diamond files, which is fine for stuff like this. These came from a pound shop and I've had them for years. And really handy because you've got these sort of round shapes that you can go in and just gently go in there and just remove the rest of that sprue nib with ease. Okay, and that makes sure we've got no fit problems then. I'm not exactly sure where they go, but we'll have a look during the build. We'll see where they go. So um, put that back in there. And then that's done. That's that done. You can also get, as if by magic, you can also get little cheap sets of files like this for a couple of pounds. And um, these will be absolutely fine. I've had these for years. And they're really, really handy for stuff like this because basically we've got mould seams to get rid of. And we want to keep everything nice and flat and square. So if you've got big sanding sticks like this, obviously they're okay for areas like that, where you can come in and just use your sanding stick to, to, to sand away the mould marks or the moulding seams, like so. But you can't get into tight areas like that. You can't get into tight areas like that. So what I'm going to do is with this sprue nib here, I'm just going to trim that away with a knife and then get a nice big flat file like this one here. And then just go in and gently, not put any pressure on, just rubbing away just to remove the mould seam. And the idea here is to take away that moulded plastic look. You can see we've got a seam down there where the two halves of the mould come together and we want to get rid of it. Now on this round part, I'm just going to scrape it. Now I have got lots and lots of extra little tools that we can use for stuff like this, but I'm not going to use those now because... As I say, this is a beginner's build and I don't expect you beginners to go out and spend all your money on tools to start with. There's also lots of different types of sanders you can buy that you can use. But again, I'm going to try and keep it basic. The other thing you can do is actually scrape this seam away with your knife. Okay, just like that. And you basically want to get rid of these mould seams because they look unsightly. And they actually make it look like a piece of plastic rather than the real thing. Now, something I would recommend you get, and this is something you get from Phil Flory, are these skinny sponges. This is the blue one. Um, I think there are many people that make these, but this is the Flory one. I think UMP make them as well. You can buy like a, a set. Um, and these are really good for sanding round parts. Now, I tend to like my Infini sponges better because they're harder wearing, then it will fall apart and wrinkle up. But the trouble is it's so big and chunky, it's no good for, for little tiny bits like this. So you can take this sponge and you can see that what happens when you're sanding, you can see the sponge is deforming around the part. So you end up not putting a flat spot on it. Now, if I use it here, I'll end up radiusing it. I want it flat, so I use the file. But on these round parts like this, I want them to be 
remain radius. So you can see that I was able to sand that seam away on there, but keep it round in shape. And then I could come in with one of my smaller files in here and get it in there and just clean up in that area in there. And this is something that a lot of people don't do when they start out. And what you'll find is when we come to the the bit of weathering and adding washes and stuff like that, and making oil washes, which we're going to be doing, what you don't want is the wash to be to enhance your mold seams. Basically, your mold seams. So as I say, you've got your mold seam where the two molds come together, and when you put a wash on there, it'll pick up any edge, any ledge, any line, or anything. And you can see, look in here, we've got the mold seams as well. So we can we can get in there with a flat file, or we can scrape it with a knife and just remove the unsightly seams that are in there. Okay, just like that. And then when you get into tighter areas where the file won't go in, you can just gently scrape it. You hear gurgling in the background, it's not me, it's the washing machine. So, uh, so you can see that this is taking a little while, um, and this is what it's all about. It's not a case of just pulling all the parts out of the bag, out of the box, and throwing them together. It's all a case of a little bit of a little bit of care, a little bit of finesse, and just make everything look as good as you possibly can without having to resort to buying loads of aftermarket stuff and everything. So there we go, those seams are dealt with in there. Now we've got ejector pin marks in here. You see these round divots. I use the end of this file to point. There's one there and there's one there. They are what's called ejector pin marks and that's what's where the, the mould has, has pushed the part out of the mould tool. And they're very unsightly and they're not very nice in most places. Now, I'm not going to worry about them too much here because I think they're going to be pretty much hidden by the wheels. If we take two of these wheels, let me fit them. No, that top one isn't. So what we can do is fill that or we can leave it. And in a minute, I'll show you what to do about filling it. We can also see these wheels are very, very sloppy on there. So we'll have a bit of problem aligning them as well. So um, basically, I'm going to get rid of that ejector pin mark in a minute and I'll show you how. So what I'm going to do now is turn the camera off and go round and do all four of these undercarriage legs and give them the same treatment as I've given this one. And then another thing you can do with these sponges, what I've done here is cut one side off so you can get into tighter places like this. Okay. And then as a final touch, if you really want to go to town, you may not trust yourself doing this if you're an absolute beginner, but you can take your extra thin, okay, dry the brush off so there's hardly anything on there, you really don't want it wet, and just brush over where you've been scraping, sanding, whatever, and that removes any sanding marks, filing marks, whatever. And don't hang about for too long, you don't want to be going in there and brushing it on and just keep brushing you want to be in and out and you can see what that's done that's got rid of all those seams okay so as I say I'll get the others done and then I'll come back for you they're all done now so all cleaned up all this all the um, molding marks are gone and everything all cleaned up and uh, nicely done so there we go, they look like undercarriage legs now rather than a piece of plastic with a great mould seam in the middle. Now if remember I said I've got these ejector pin marks I want to get rid of. So basically I'm going to use this. This is Mr Surfacer 1000. My regular followers know I absolutely love this stuff and I use it for a lot. Um, we could also use this, the Viejo uh, plastic putty, um, which I don't tend to rate. We could also use some ordinary Tamiya filler. The trouble with those two is, is getting them neatly on there and not getting anywhere else. The beauty of this, it's like a like a liquid filler almost. Um, so you can see it's a fairly thick 
grey paint. And basically what you can do with this is with a small brush we can come along oops, and we can just literally put a drop in the hole like so. Okay, and we're just going to build it up so that it ends up on a slightly raised. Do the same down here as well, although it's not going to be seen, we may as well do it. And that will actually shrink back. So you want to actually get a, a raised lump on the top of it rather than um, rather than have it shallow. And we may even need to put a second application on. But in this small area, it won't take long to dry. We can deal with it once it's dry, we can deal with it then. There we go. And as you can see, it's easy to get it precisely into that place. Whereas with the filler, you'd be struggling to get it just in that one little spot, because particularly around here, sanding it will be quite difficult. There we go. And then with the Mr. Surface, you don't need to clean the brush, just wipe it off if you're going to use a brush which is dedicated to Mr. Surfacer. So that's that, and we can leave those to dry now. So we can put them to one side. And then we can start looking at what we need next. Now the linkage here is part number 21. Again, we need to make four of them. So here's our linkages here. We're back to our original sprue now that our wheels were on. Our wheels were over here. So here we've got part 21. And we've got two on this sprue, two on the other sprue. So we can just basically come along with our cutters, and cut these off. One, two, three, and four. Okay, so we look at these parts now. When we compare them to the instructions, when we look, we've got, they're going to go this way round. So we've got basically the arm coming down the top here. So, sorry, we've got the arm coming down the top here. Then we've got that arm going in and then this one coming down. So here's our arm coming down the top. We've got this one going in and this one coming down. So you can see we've got these ejector tabs on here. So once again, we'll take our little bin and we'll just cut these off because we don't need them. And as I say, I mean, usually with um, Tamiya kits and stuff, they will tell you to remove these bits. They will show you in the instructions. Uh, this one does on those bits there, but it doesn't tell you on these. So um, you have to work it out for yourself. And then again, I'm going to come in with this file. OK, so um, camera ran out there, so I had to uh, offload everything and get it, uh, get it, you know, start again, basically. So I've cleaned one of them up now. And you can see here what I've done here is with a file or I can come with a pair of snips and I can remove the excess sprue gates from here. Okay, so we've got one on each end. Well, there's one there, one there, and one there. And then we can come along with a file, something hard, something not soft, so it's not gonna round everything off. And we could just go in and remove those sprue nibs, like so. Okay, and then the flats, we could just take the file Lightly stroke across, again, no pressure, just gently sanding to remove the seams. The only thing we can do, as I showed you before, we could use a knife and just scrape. Scrape away the seams, like so. And you can buy all sorts of tools and stuff for doing this. You've got your Alex scrapers. Um, you can get them for premium hobbies, and if you use my uh, NMB10, you get 10% off everything. So most of the equipment you see me use here is available from there, um, other than the, the, the skinny sanders. Um, so basically, yeah, go in with a file, scrape it with a knife, 
uh, you can use. Here's an Alex scraper here. This is one with all sorts of special forms and stuff. And you can just come along with one of these and you can, that's, I picked one that I've done. You can come along with one of these and just scrape it. Just scrape it like so. But really the things these are ideal for is getting into troughs and stuff. Um, if you're trying to sand, like if you've got something which has got a female curve in it and you want to remove um, a, a mold seam or a, um, an injection pin mark or something, these are great for getting in there. Like if I wanted to get into these engine halves here, so I wanted to get into this engine half here, remove these ejector pin marks, then I could just pick the right radius and come in and just scrape or if I want to remove that number from there. That's what they're ideal for. There's nothing else really you can use to get in there. Um, they're obviously massive, so I'm not going to use it for that, but very handy little tool, but you don't need it as a beginner. So um, there we go. So that's two of them done now, two of them cleaned up. And I'll just do this one with a knife, just in case you don't have files and stuff. So you can just come along, scrape it with a knife. And I'm getting in the light such that when I look at it, I can see a shiny... The shiny plastic and where you scrape it it becomes dull. I'm hoping you can see that on the camera too. So I've looked there, get it in the get it in the light, it becomes shiny and then I scrape across the top. And where I scrape it becomes dull and what I'm looking for is the whole surface to become dull. Again over the top like that. Then we can come with a file on the ends and just remove these sprue nibs, just like so. As you can see, as I said before, the the art of modelling and end up with a nice result is all about the preparation and the clean up, getting rid of your sprue nibs to ensure a good fit, get rid of your mould seams, and uh, yeah, mould seams are especially like on stuff like undercarriage legs. It's the it's the biggie, you know. If you see an undercarriage leg on a really beautifully built model, it's all you know. It can have all the best aftermarket and the best resin and all painted up beautifully and weathered and God knows what. And if you've got a dirty great mould seam down the middle of the undercarriage leg, it just takes away from all of it. And there we go. So I'm going to finish off cleaning these up and then I'll come back. Right, so there we go then. All our legs are cleaned up now and basically ready to glue on. The Mr. Servicer is still drying in those... Um, there's ejection marks so we have to be careful not to touch that but basically what we're going to do now is go on and glue these on and once again you can see you know some of these model manufacturers the modern guys should take a tip from this we've got here again some engineering involved so as you can see from the instructions these these are going to go on to the front of the or front and back of the um, undercarriage legs and what they've done they've made the, the bottom hole here larger than the top one and on here the pin it's larger than them so you can't if you try and put them upside down it physically won't fit together okay so really really good the way they've done this so really really nice so what we can do now is come along with our extra thin and this is in this instance we can put the extra thin in first so we just put a drop in there and a drop in there and then quickly come along with your part you need to be quick because the the mr the mr servicer the extra thin will dry quickly we can just push the part in there like so and then that middle leg where's my knife gone that middle leg there that needs to line up with this leg here so basically you just twist it around until it all lines up and there we go and now we can come along as we did before they're extra thin and just brush around on here and it'll take out any filing marks or little burrs on the edges or anything a bit fluffy 
I'm just going to put some glue in the joints there. We want this to be nice and strong. It's got a lot of weight to support and I'm hoping they're going to be strong enough. I think they will be. There's been thousands of these built and I've never heard complaints about weak undercarriage. So there we go. So that's that one. And then we'll do another one. Turn it over. Put some glue in there, some glue in there. And then put the leg in. And then another drop of glue around there, another drop of glue around there. Make sure it's nice and strong. Drop of glue in there. Make sure we've got that joint there in the middle. And there we are. That's not even touching that one in the middle, so. There we are. Now, as you can see there, where I've touched it, I don't know if you can make it out, but the glue is capillaried up on my finger. So basically, don't worry about it. Just leave it and then you can come along afterwards with extra thin, brush some extra thin over it, and lo and behold, the finger mark will disappear. Around all the edges. And there we go. Just like that. Some glue around there, some glue around there, run it around all the edges. And then the last one. Some glue in there, some glue in there. There we go. So that's all four of those done. So we need to wait for that Mr. Servicer to dry and then we can do a little bit of work on that and get sanding it away. But basically we can go around afterwards now and check. Now I can see I've still got a bit of a mold seam on there. So I can just rub that over with a knife and then come with the extra thin, brush it over. That's that mold seam gone. Same there. Lots of bits of plastic shavings and that's it so that's all four of our legs done and like I say wait for that Mr. Servicer to dry just see how they look with the wheels on I think they're gonna look pretty impressive there we go you can see they look quite impressive and big and chunky so for 70 second scale they're huge so um I think we'll call that a day for part one while we wait for that Mr. Servicer to dry. Um, there'll be more building in the next video because this video has been about the waffling and the intro and airbrushing and blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, look forward to seeing you for part two. As I say, any questions, pop in the comments below. Um, no, no question is a stupid question unless it's something I've already talked about in the video because you haven't watched it. Uh, so thanks for watching. I'll see you for part two. Don't forget to hit that subscribe, hit the notifications bell and give me a like. I'll see you later guys. Bye for now.